Bible, turn to Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. If you notice the, the title in your Bible, probably to the, what's called the paracopy, this section of Scripture, it's that, that uh, Jesus calming the storms or the winds and the waves obey Jesus, that you have, might have various things in there. When it comes to portions of Scripture like this, it, it, it's something we have to approach, approach with caution, especially as, as preachers, because it very quickly becomes what's called a Betty Boop sermon. Not Betty Boop. Bo Peep, little Bo Peep sermon. Wow, I got my characters mixed up there for a second. Little Bo Peep sermon. Now, little Bo Peep sermons are fine, I guess, uh, but you don't need the Bible to preach them. And I'll give you an example. If you see on your screen up here, little Bo Peep, she lost her sheep. Have you ever lost your sheep? Maybe you feel like you are the lost sheep. You know, it becomes a motivational thing not something you need Jesus for. And we want to be careful not to do that. We don't want to tread into something that we don't need Scripture for because Scripture's there for the sermon, right? And it's pointing us to Jesus. These types of sermons, those little Bo Peep types of sermons, they don't grow your faith in Jesus. They grow your faith in yourself. And that's not what this passage is about. That's not what Scripture is is about, ever. It's always to point us to Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to begin reading in verse 35, and I'm reading out of the CSB translation. It says, On that day when evening had come, he told them, Let's cross over to the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him along since he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. So they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and the seas obey him. The title of this message today is The Unplanned Storms. Because the storms often rise, right? And, And I'm speaking metaphorically here, not literally as Mark was. Those storms, those times in life where it feels like everything's falling apart and I might even die. But those storms rise up in order to raise our faith. Not our faith in ourselves, but our faith in Christ. It was Charles Spurgeon who famously said, I have learned to kiss the waves that send me crashing against the rock of ages. That's what the storms are there for. Now too often we read this or we read the parallels and if if you're taking notes and want the parallels, it's Matthew 8, 18 through 27, Luke 8, 22 through 25. This is one of the synoptic stories that happens in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And too often, when we hear a sermon on this, what ends up happening is the preacher focuses so much on the storm, we forget to focus on Jesus. And that's the same mistake the disciples made. They focused on the storm, not on who they had in the boat with them. We do this naturally. This is human nature. Because so many times the storm seems so great We forget how great our Savior is. Sometimes we see the the oncoming storm and our faith feels dwarfed by its power and we forget the power of the Savior. We forget that during all of this, it is about Jesus. It is about going back to Him. Now, where our faith is during the storm matters, but where our faith remains when the storm has passed also matters. Whether we're singing praises from the other shore or whether we are singing praises from the wreckage or whether we're not even able to sing praises at all. Where our faith is matters. As the storms rise, so must our faith rise. It was Owen Strzok in the a uh, professor and pastor who said, do not forget, Christian, all the hardness and harshness of this fallen world is appointed by God to let us know and taste 
the stark difference between a sin-cursed realm and a perfectly kind Father. What a selling point for Christianity. Come to Jesus and things get hard. Come to Jesus and you might die. I can't imagine the guy who went to Jesus that first time and he was like, if you want to be my disciple, you pick up your cross and follow me. I just figure him going, okay, I'm out. You know, that's not, that's not something that I want to sign up for. If I went to a dentist and on the sign it says, guaranteed, we will pull all your teeth today. I'm not going to that dentist. But if it meant that that was going to save my life, that's what I need, right? Christianity's not easy. It's not easy for the, the lay person. It's not easy for the pastor. It's never meant to be. In fact, I read a study recently that said one in every 10 pastors, actually 12% was the exact numbers, 12% of pastors in the last year have considered suicide. Wow. Not me. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for your concern. But let that sink in. You know, prior to COVID, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, if you were to turn on any famous preacher or even medi- mediocrely, is that even a word? A, me- a mediumly famous preacher, what were they normally preaching on? You don't need to be afraid. Ah, but then the train wreck called 2020 happened. And rubber meets the road. And we have to practice what we preach. And many of these pastors had to face their fears. Church people aren't coming back like they used to. The online presence isn't what it once was. The giving's down. No wonder they're, they're giving up. A friend of mine tell, told me once, a motivational speaker will tell you how to defeat faith from, uh, sorry, to defeat fear with faith within yourself, but a preacher, a pastor, will tell you how to defeat sin with faith in Christ. I'll say that again because I stumbled through it. A motivational speaker tells you how to defeat fear with faith in yourself. A pastor tells you how to defeat sin with faith in Christ. For the Christian, there will always be one of four seasons. There will be a time of teaching, which we have seen in the previous couple of sermons as Jesus taught through parables. There will be a season of testing, a time of trusting, and a time of telling. You're always going to be in one of those four seasons. And so today we're going to cover those last three, testing, trusting, and telling. And the first one, of course, we see is testing. Now, if you've been in school, you know with any time of teaching, there must come a test, right? What did you learn? Well, this is for the disciples such a time. We read back in verse 35, on that day when evening had come, he told them, let's cross over to the other side of the sea. Now, this is taking place at sundown, which for the, in the Jewish mindset, that's evening, that's nighttime, right? We, we talked about the Sabbath and how it began from sundown and went to sundown. Now, Jesus has been teaching on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. This is more densely populated at this point. It would have been mostly Jewish cities and Jewish audiences that were listening to him. But he says, he gets it in his mind, it seems, they need to go to the other shore, the western shore. No, I'm sorry, the eastern shore. He was on the western shore. He's going to the eastern shore. Wow, I need my coffee. Or maybe I need to stop drinking coffee. Huh? The eastern shore is going to have less people. The eastern shore is mostly Gentiles, not Jews. And Jesus says this to them. If you read the Greek and you understand it, the subject tense is that there's a sense of urgency. Jesus isn't just saying, guys, we'll get there when we get there. He says, we must go, we must go now. That's the the emphasis he's making. That Jesus has to cross this sea. Now, most commentators, when they read this, they will tell you, well, Jesus was tired. And clearly he was. He slept through a storm, right? But there's something else to this. Most of you who've attended on Wednesday nights, you know this. The chapter numbers in your Bible did not exist until around the 1500s. We added them to help people find their place in their scripture. We're to read these things. Really, it's nice for doing a sermon series. It kind of helps you divide things up. But we're to read this in light of what comes next. Now, some of you may remember the sermon I gave a while back on the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Jesus tells the disciples in John 4, 4, 
we have to go through Samaria. In fact, John says, and the way he writes is like, Jesus just had to go through Samaria. But he also makes it very clear, not really. Jews don't go through Samaria. In fact, they go around Samaria. They want to avoid Samaritans. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans, but Jesus just had to go through Samaria. Why? Because he has a divine appointment with the woman at the well. He goes to a place no one else would go to meet with someone no one else would talk to. And what's he do? He takes this woman and she becomes an evangelist. And she goes into her town and she begins to preach about Jesus and drawing people to Jesus. We see the same thing in light of what's coming next, and not next week, but in a couple of weeks. Jesus has a divine appointment with a man no one wants to be around. Everybody's afraid of. Why? Because he is the garrison demoniac. He is demon-possessed. And so Jesus says, we've got to get to the other side. He's got a divine appointment. Now, he knows this. He's God. We understand this. The narrator of Mark, Mark, has made this very clear to us since the very beginning of chapter 1. Jesus is the Son of God. He's divine. He knows what's on the other side of the sea, and he knows what's going to happen between point A and point B. That rhymed. That was unintentional. But notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't warn the disciples of the coming storm. Now on the Sea of Galilee, if we would like, the Sea of Galilee had storms that would rise up unexpectedly. It should just be assumed that might happen when you're crossing that particular sea. And when you travel with Jesus, storms are guaranteed. In fact, the Apostle Paul told his disciple, Timothy, in fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus himself told his disciples, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. You will be hated by everyone because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Again, not the best selling point for Christianity, but it's a fact. You want to serve Jesus? You're going to lose friends. You want to serve Jesus? You're going to have family mad at you. People are going to be upset with you. He does not guarantee your momentary safety, but if you endure, he guarantees your eternal safety. And that's what Jesus cares more about. Some of you have heard me say this. Jesus doesn't care if you get sick or not. He wants to make sure that you make it to heaven. That's what he cares about more. said that wrong. He does care if you get sick, but he cares more about where you'll spend eternity. When the time of testing rises, we have to say to ourselves, we have to fill our hearts and our minds with the word of God and its promises that say things like, the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. It doesn't say he'll strengthen you and guard you from evil. 2 Thessalonians 3.3. Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. And one of my favorite passages, Joshua 1.9. Haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. But where does he take Joshua to the battlefield? Joshua's going to lose men. Joshua's going to see his friends die. Joshua's going to suffer defeat, the battle of the city of Ai. He's going to go through it. But what's God say? Don't be afraid. I'm still with you. Jesus does not guarantee our safety when we cross the sea, but he guarantees to be in the boat as the storm rises. Verse 36, So they left the crowd and took him along since he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. Now in another instance, in Matthew 14, Jesus doesn't stay in the boat. He gets out, he dismisses the crowd, and a storm rises up, a smaller storm, much smaller storm, and he's going to walk on the water. This is not that instance, right? Jesus has been teaching from the boat. He's in the boat. And the rest of the disciples likely join him in the boat, and they push off, and they begin to go across the water. But there's something we have to catch here, because Mark is the only one between the three synoptic gospels who mentions this. There are other boats on the sea that day. In fact, the the word used there is the Greek word ploiaria, and it means smaller boats were with him. And well, that makes sense because Jesus is traveling with at least 12 other men, right? 
So they're going to need a bigger boat to get across there. But we have to take this into account. We have to understand that there are other people who experience similar storms to, we, to what we experience, but do they have Jesus in their boat? That really matters, right? We should take into account that at least four of these men who are traveling with Jesus, possibly as many as eight, at least four of them were fishermen. They were professional fishermen, not professional sailors. You know the difference? A fisherman gets in a boat and he thinks, all I got to do is catch some fish. The sailor gets in the boat and says, I got to take this boat from point A to point B. He's more concerned with the navigation. He's more concerned with the travel. He's more concerned with the the mercantile side of things and, and the cargo and things of that nature. A sailor would have been nice in this situation, but instead you get some B-list sailors, fishermen. In their own dealings as fishermen, they likely would have stayed to the shore. They wouldn't have been, they would have definitely been out of their element here. Anytime a, a storm rises up, Peter, James, John, Andrew, they're saying, uh, nope, forget that, I'm going home. I'm here to catch fish, not die in a hurricane, Right? They're headed to the other sea, and this storm rises up. Matthew, or sorry, Mark 4.37 says, A great windstorm rose, and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. Now, this is not your average rainy day. This isn't the Monday grumpies. You know, someone's got a case of the Mondays. It's not that. This isn't I skipped my cup of coffee and I can't function today, and everything seems to not work for me. This is life or death. The Greek here is actually, uh, the Greek word is lalaps anaman. In fact, it's preceded by the word megas lalaps anaman. Megas, mega, big, great, fierce, deadly. Lalaps anaman means it is a, a, it is a fierce wind, a whirlwind. In fact, Matthew, when he tells this story, Matthew 8, 24, says suddenly a violent storm arose on the sea. And the word Matthew uses there is the Greek word seismos, where we get the word seismic, like seismic activity. This is an earth-shaking type of storm. This is huge. Not meant to be understood as just a bit of rain, and now the disciples are upset. This is, we're going to die type of day. And this is the test for the disciples. They've had their time of teaching, their time of hearing Jesus talk about the word taking root. They've heard him talk about the, 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 just a little grain of mustard seed taking root and becoming a great tree and having deep roots. But now, has it taken root within them? Do they get it? Do they have faith in what they've been told? Do they have faith in who told them these things? He's called them to be his apostles. He's designated them for this task. Did he really do that just to let them die in the water? No. As George Whitfield famously said, we are immortal until our work on earth is done. We will experience storms. We will experience testing. Now, some people say, speak to the storm. Just name your victory. Claim your victory. But you cannot do that. You can't. There's nobody else in all of Scripture that calms the storm but Jesus especially not in the New Testament. You can make the argument Elijah stopped the rain, but Elijah brought the fire too. And actually he did all of that asking God to do it, not himself. Jesus is the only one who can calm the storm. In the New Testament, if anybody else could have, it would have been the Apostle Paul, a man of greater faith than all of us combined. I assure you of that. And yet Paul said, five times I received 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning, three times I was shipwrecked. Now, pause for a second. Three times he was shipwrecked? Three different storms at sea, and Jesus didn't calm a single one of them. Think about that. He says, I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, and dangers among false brothers, toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, 
often without food, cold, and without clothing, not to mention other things. There's the daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. Now, sometimes we read that and we say, well, Paul, why didn't you just ask Jesus to calm the storm? And I imagine Paul goes, gee, I never thought of that. Very sarcastic if you didn't pick up on that. I'm sure he did, but Jesus doesn't. And yet Paul still follows him and has faith in him from the wreckage. As he drifts at sea, he still says, Jesus, you are still my king. Now, some other times, preachers will read this, and, and this is the, what they'll say. They'll say, you think your storms are bad? You, you should hear what Paul has to say. Uh, those were Paul's storms. Your pain is very real to you. My pain is very real to me. One thing you, you have to understand, when, especially when counseling and loving people, is, you know what? When, someone, when, when my little girl comes home and somebody told her she was ugly at school that day, and this is hypothetical, my daughters are beautiful, so that will never happen. But like, let's say one of their friends tells them they're ugly, and that just really hurts their heart. And maybe that day, uh, somebody at, uh, at Casey's yelled at me or, or cut me off as I was trying to leave the parking lot, and I'm really angry, I'm really hurt. My daughter comes home. You know, somebody saying something mean to my daughter hurts just as much, if not more, than what happened to me that day. People's hurts are their own. People's storms are their own. And there are some who can handle things stronger than you did, but still try to be empathetic and sympathetic as people deal with their own storms. Your time of testing may look like marriage trouble. Your storm may look like problems with your children or your unsaved relatives. You may look at a stack of bills that you can't pay and say, God, I need you to calm this storm. Maybe you have repairs to your house or to your vehicle you you can't afford to make. Maybe you have a job you wish you could quit or you just lost a job you really liked or you really needed. Storms look different for everybody. I remember a time, it was not long after we had left my youth pastor position at a church in Indianapolis, and I guarantee we had single digits in our checking account. We didn't have a savings account. What, what was a savings account? 20-year-old Jeff had no idea what a savings account should look like. I got 20 bucks in savings. I am rich, you know. We had nothing. We had one vehicle, this junky Chevy S10. And every day, because I had no job at this point, in faith I'd quit and thought God was going to take care of us. And he let me sit on the couch for almost six months watching Doctor Who and crying a lot. And I will never forget this day. I I would take my wife to work in the morning, and if a job interview were to come up, I would have the truck. But then I would just go pick her up at 4.30, and they very rarely ever even called back, it seemed. And this day I picked Jennifer up, and I had just sat on the couch all day long. God, why do you hate me? Why do you let this happen? I was going through a storm, and I was trying to do it alone. And I picked Jennifer up, and if you ever want to Google Maps this to, to fact check me, we were crossing Lynnhurst and on Rockville Road in Indianapolis, the west side, and the truck died. Remember this? Only thing that worked were the brakes. And I was able to uh, turn into this little parking lot um, right in front of, I think it was a little Mexican restaurant or, or saloon or something in this little strip mall that we never went to because it was a rough neighborhood. And I just sat there staring at the, at the steering wheel. you got to be kidding me. And I'm trying to deal with this in my own heart, in my own mind. And I look over, and Jennifer just has tears. She's bawling. Guys, do not do what I did. I looked at her and said, what's your problem? Don't, just don't do that, okay? For one, I, my wife shows a lot of grace. And she looked at me, she said, why does God keep letting this stuff happen to us? Guys, I gotta tell you, I, then I broke. I've been asking myself that all day long. I've been asking myself that all week long. I've been asking myself that for months at this point. But you know what I realized in that moment? I was trying to do it all by myself. I was trying to calm the storm. And yeah, I had Jesus. But you know what Jesus gave me? 
Somebody else to help me shoulder that. Somebody else that I could lean on. Somebody else that could have encouraged me and support me. And Jennifer tried, but I didn't want to hear it, you know. That's what we do. That's what the disciples did. You notice in the text, Peter doesn't go to James, John, and Andrew and say, guys, we're all fishermen. Let's figure this out. We got this. You know, we can, we've got Jesus. We can do this. You don't see that happening. You don't see Thaddeus go up to Matthew and say, hey, tax collector, we're both out of our element here. But uh, you know what? We got this guy in the boat. I think he can figure it out. Let's just have a little faith in him. You don't see that. Instead, what they do is they go, Jesus, teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? It was a certainty. They'd already given up. And you, facing your storms, have other people in this room that you can lean on. And they'll encourage you and pray with you and pray for you. If they don't, I will. That's what you have a pastor for. You don't have to face the storms alone. And if nothing else, you've got Jesus. The time of testing may not be satanic. It may not be from the devil, but he is an opportunistic worm. He loves to make you feel alone. He loves to make you feel like you're surrounded by problems when in fact, you're probably surrounded by people who will love you and encourage you and help you. The devil feasts on isolated Christians. That's why we're told to meet together and encourage one another and spur one another on. And if we didn't have conflict, there's this great quote by David Wilkerson that says, if we didn't have conflict, pressure, trials, and wars within, we would become passive and lukewarm. Decay would set in and our temple would lie in ruins. We would not be able to handle the territory we have gained. That is why the enemy's plan against us is clear. He wants to remove all the fight from us. The simple truth is we find all our resources, strength to go on, power over the enemy in our spiritual battles. On that day, when we stand before the Lord, he will remind us, do you remember what you went through on that occasion, in that awful battle, in the midst of that awful trial? Look what you accomplished through it all. The fact is, God put his treasure in human bodies. He has made you a temple, a house for his spirit to dwell in. If you become lazy and careless, neglecting the maintenance work needed, regular prayer, feeding on God's word, fellowshipping with the saints, decay will set in and you will end up in absolute ruin. When we think we can overcome the test by ourselves, we fail the test. When our faith does not rise higher than the storms, we will drown. But most of all, we must recognize that we have to trust Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18 says, it's a reminder from the Apostle Paul who went through many storms, like I said, for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolute, incomparable, eternal weight of glory, So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is temporary, uh, for what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. When the unplanned storms rise up, our faith must rise even higher. Our faith in Christ. And it takes us from testing to trusting. Verse 38 says, He was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. So they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care we're going to die? Now you think about this for a second. The stern was this little bench in the boat that the sailors could have sat on or even laid down and taken a nap on on a normal day. The cushion was for the helmsman, the guy who would steer the ship. And the guy who's got it is asleep. He's taking a nap. The disciples, if they're now putting their trust in him, we have to ask, who does Jesus trust? Where is his faith? It's in the Father. It's in his own divine authority that's been given to him. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And Mark makes it abundantly clear, Jesus is God. Even though that hasn't been revealed to the disciples in the story, it has been revealed to the reader. So because of who he is, because he's trusting the Father, Jesus is able to find rest. He's able to take a nap. And in doing so, he sets an example, not just for the 12 disciples, but for us. When we're secure in him, We're able to have peace in the storms. David writes, I lie down and sleep. I wake up again because the Lord sustains me. He writes again in Psalm 4, 8, I will both lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, Lord, make me live in safety. 
Proverbs 19.23 says, The fear of the Lord leads to life. One will sleep at night without danger. So Jesus sets this example. And we see in him what perfect trust in the Father looks like. Jesus knew his calling. He knew where he was headed because he knew the Father. And if the disciples understood this, they'd have been able to relax a little bit too. And what do they say to him? Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? Only I imagine it was like, Teacher, don't you know we're going to die? They're scared. They're afraid. And the first thing they say is, they call him teacher. In the KJV, the King James, translates it as master. But if you read it in the Greek, it's the word didaskale, and it means instructor, one who teaches. Matthew uses a slightly different word. He uses the Greek word kairi, which means Lord. Luke uses the same word. So we have to ask, why does Mark use something different. Why does Mark have a different picture he seems to be trying to paint here? Well, we have to ask ourselves, just like last week, what's Mark's theology? What's the purpose of Mark's gospel? What's the reason he's writing it like this? Well, it's because Mark has two themes within his gospel. One is that Jesus has come to destroy the works of the enemy and that Jesus came to teach and to preach. Now, notice they don't come to Jesus and say, hey, miracle worker, work a miracle. They don't come to him and say, hey, you healed all these people. Can't you fix, do something about the weather? They don't do that. In fact, they say, teacher, don't you care? Don't you know? You ever been there? God, do you even care? Yeah, he's able to sleep. And likely it was a very deep sleep in the middle of a storm. And that's how our trust should be in him. Our faith should be in him when life hits us in the face with the metaphorical frying pan. But we don't panic. Instead, we rest in him as he rests in the Father. Verse 39 says, He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now, if you notice here, the words Jesus uses to rebuke the storm is the same, they're the exact same words he used to rebuke the demon-possessed man in the synagogue in chapter 1. It's silence, be still, or silence, be quiet, depending on your translation. Now, I don't say that to indicate that this storm is demonic or that there's some extra spiritual thing around that. That's not the picture Mark is trying to paint here. Instead, what we're we're to take away is this is Jesus demonstrating Not just his power over the spiritual world that he's clearly demonstrated, but his power over nature itself. He calms the storm with the same authority that he casts out demons. What are we supposed to get from that? That he's the master of all. That he's God. With the same authority that he heals the leper, he can calm your storm. Jesus has shown these disciples many things about himself, and we'll get into that as we go. But as great as the storm was, as fierce as it was, again, we see this Greek word megas show up again. As great as the storm was, the calm was also very great. The calm was fierce. One commentary said, sometimes God saves us from trouble, sometimes he saves us in trouble, sometimes he saves us from death, and sometimes he uses our death to glorify his name. So the question we have to ask is, do I trust him? Do we trust him? Do we expect Jesus to calm the storm? And is he still Jesus even if he doesn't? Do I go to him when the trials and the tribulations come? Or do I try to do it myself? Does my faith rise with the storm or does it drown in the sea? Do I trust Jesus on an eternal scale? That's the question. Well, Jesus calms the storm for these disciples. He won't do it for Paul in Acts 27. Again, even though Paul was a man of great faith, the disciples did not have a lot of faith. You know, the calming of the storm doesn't depend on your faith, the uh, the greatness of it. It just matters on where it's at. God strengthened Paul to endure the storm, and he saved him out of the wreckage. But does our faith still rise? Maybe a better way, maybe a better question we should really ask, ask ourselves, am I I willing to trust God from the wreck? If I don't make it through this, 
Do I still trust him? Fascinating to me in the book of Job, Job 13, 15. Those of you who know me, you know that's one of my favorite books of the Bible. He says, even if he kills me, I will hope in him. The way I had it memorized is, though he slay me, still I will hope in him. Now, if you go to your Bible and you go to Job 13 and you look down at the very bottom of your Bible in the footnotes, there's, there's just this little thing in italics. It says, another translation reads, he will surely slay me. I have no hope. Think about that. When we're facing trials, when we're facing storms, when we're facing the, the life or death situations that, that happen as we go from birth to death, that's the two attitudes we can have as we face these things. Even if God doesn't save me from this, I'm going to hope in him. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. Our God is capable from saving us from you, Nebuchadnezzar, but even if he doesn't, he's still God, and we're not going to bow down. Or you can say, eh, he's going to kill me, I give up. I'm out. That's the way we can react. Where is our trust? Where is our faith? These things reveal that. Like the mustard seed, do you grow stronger when you're crushed? Like the soils, do you, you find out where your roots are and how deep they go when the storms rise up. We have to trust that he has a purpose behind the pain, that he's shaping us, that though he slay me, still I will hope in him. Our faith must rise higher than the winds and the waves. And when we go through those times, you know what we do very naturally? And when we come out of them, what do we do even more? We talk about it. We tell others about it. And that takes us to the season of telling. Verse 40 reads, he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? You know, there's a conversation every single person is going to have to have with Christ at some point, And it's, it's this. Why are you afraid? Where's your faith? Every person is going to have to answer that question at some point. For some of us, it may come here. For others, it may come much later. But he still asks, do you still have no faith to us, the same as he asked the 12 disciples? Literally, in the Greek, what he says to them is, why are you this cowardly? That's kind of harsh. Somebody said that to me, I would probably throw him out of the boat at that point, right? But Mark records it, and actually Mark's rebuke is even more gentle than what Matthew and Luke record. And the Greek word faith here is the Greek word pistis. And I've talked about this at some length before. Pistis, faith, is not a blind shot in the dark. It is belief based on evidence. So what Jesus is really saying to them is why are you a bunch of cowards? Haven't I given you enough evidence? Haven't I given you enough reason to trust in me? And let's look back. Let's see what, what evidence has he given? What have the disciples seen so far? They've seen exorcisms. They've seen it in Mark 1, 25 and 32. Multiple healings, Mark 1, 34. Peter's own mother-in-law was healed, Mark 1, 31. A man cured of leprosy in Mark 1, 41 and 42. Jesus has forgiven someone's sins. Only God can do that, right? Mark 2, 5. And then he heals the guy to prove that he's God in Mark 2, 11 and 12. They've seen him outsmart and outplay the Pharisees and scribes at every angle. In Mark 2, 17, they've heard him refer to himself as the Lord of the Sabbath, which he's saying, I'm Lord of the law. I'm the one who wrote the law. That's, what, that's the point he's getting at. Who gave it to Moses? Mark 2, 28. They've all been designated to be his apostles, his representatives in Mark 3, 14. They've heard his teachings. They've spent countless hours and days and nights with him. By this point, you'd think they would have a general idea of what he's capable of, but Jesus looks at them and says, but you still don't trust me. You still don't have any faith. No wonder Jesus said, to them much later after the resurrection. Because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. What have you seen Jesus do? Has he changed your heart? I'm not asking, what has he done for you lately? 
Let's not ask that question. That's a dangerous way to go. But what have you seen him do? What evidence of him in your life have you seen? Is it enough to weather the storm and to trust him? And even if it's not, do you do it anyway? Do you know what he's done for you? Do you know how much he loves you? Because if you don't, there are two planks of wood on the wall behind me that symbolize everything you need to know about. Verse 41 says, They were terrified and asked one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. This is where it's interesting to me. This is where it's fascinating because as scared as the disciples were of the storm, the word terrified here, it's actually three words in the Greek. Megas, uh, I, have not, I can't pronounce the other two. So it literally translates great alarmed terror. As afraid of the storm as they were, they're even more afraid of Jesus at this point. Wow, if he can do this, who is he? What is he? And what do they do after that? What are they doing as they ask this question? They're talking about him. They're talking about what Jesus has done. And we saw this back in chapter 2 when Jesus heals the leper. He heals this man. He tells him, don't tell anybody. But what happens? He went out. He began to proclaim it widely and spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly. What we're starting to see in the Gospel of Mark throughout this series, what we're really starting to see take place is that we are meant to talk about Jesus. We are meant to tell others about him, that there is some push for evangelism. There is some push for us to share what we've seen, to share what we've experienced, and to not just do it amongst ourselves. That's what the disciples are doing here. You know what Christians talk about most amongst other Christians? Other Christians. Should be Jesus, right? If we're honest. Of course, this all culminates in the Great Commission and what's called the long ending of Mark, Mark chapter 16. It says, Then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. The point is clear. Talk about what Jesus has done, what experience you've had with him. Share it. When you've gone through the storms, when you've gone through the trials, when you've gone through the tribulations, but yet you know in your core, you know in the deepest part of your heart who he is and that he's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He's never going to give up. He's not going to let you down. Yeah, the surviving of the storm is a lot harder than the calming of the storm, but he's still your God or he's not. Your faith rises and with it, so does your Ability to speak about him. So does your consistency speaking about him, telling about him. I'm going to move to close in just a moment. I want to do this with a quote from John Piper. I think it's a powerful truth, and I kind of stumbled on it a few days ago, a few weeks ago, actually. But John Piper is no stranger to sickness and trial. He has a very rebellious son who's now famous for being the rebellious pastor's kid on social media. He survived cancer himself, and he writes, Not only is all your affliction momentary, not only is all your affliction light in comparison to eternity and the glory there, but all of it is totally meaningful. Every millisecond of your pain, from the fallen nature or fallen man, every millisecond of your misery in the path of obedience is producing a a peculiar glory you will get because of that. I don't care if it was cancer or criticism. I don't care if it was slander or sickness. It was not meaningless. It's doing something. It's not meaningless. Of course, you can't see what it's doing. Don't look to what is seen. When your mom dies, when your kid dies, when you've got cancer at 40, when a car careens into the sidewalk and takes her out, don't say that's meaningless. It's not. It's working for you an eternal weight of glory. Therefore, therefore, do not lose heart, but take these truths and day by day focus on them. Preach them to yourself every morning. Get alone with God and preach his word into your mind until your heart sings with confidence that you are a new creation and you are cared for. Church, hear me this morning. Whatever thing you go through, whatever thing you might be going through, Jesus is still God. 
trust in him. Jesus is still in the boat. And you might be saying, Jesus, calm the storm, or Jesus, just get me through the storm. But it's much better than saying, Jesus, we're all going to die. Though he slay me, still I will hope in him. Well, this isn't comforting. This doesn't make me feel good. It's not supposed to. It's supposed to make you feel good about Christ. Open our eyes to who he is and what we are not. Many of you have heard me say this. He is God, I am not. Does our faith in him rise with the wind and the waves? Now I'm going to close in prayer, I promise. But if you need prayer this morning, if you are going through something, I'm going to do something. I'm going to ask you not to even get up from where you are, but just raise your hand so we can pray for you or someone can come along and pray with you. I'm going to close in prayer. If you want someone to pray with you specifically, you're, of course you're free to come to the front and our prayer team will join you. But if you're here and you're just saying, I need prayer, raise your hand. We're going to have a member of our prayer team come and sit with you for a moment. Father God, we just ask you this morning, Lord, you know what each and every one of us is going through because you're going through it with us. If our hope is in you, if our trust is in you, if we understand who you are, Lord, we can weather the storm or you'll calm it. Or we will die. But either way, you're still God. Let us trust in you. Let us hope in you. For those who are saying, but my faith isn't that strong. Lord, your word says in our weakness, you are stronger. Father, I pray right now for those who are hurting, for those who are sick, for those who've been devastated this past couple of years, either economically, physically, or even especially spiritually, Father. Bring healing, I pray. Bring peace and an ability to rest in you when everything else seems to be falling apart. Lord, we trust in you. We rest in you. And our hope is in you, come what may. Father, I ask for peace. In Jesus' name, amen.